Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for our IDEA virtual user group. Our presentation today is by Lee Sullivan and Mark Luciani um, from CIT Commercial Services. Lee and Mark will be telling us about Benford's Law and why and how we should be using Benford's on our analysis. If you have any questions, please type them in the question box on the right hand side of your screen. We will answer them at the end of the webcast. This webcast is also being recorded. We will send out the slides and the recording in the next couple of days. Welcome. I am going to turn control over to Lee and Mark. Thank you, gentlemen. Good afternoon and thank you. Um, I'm Mark Luciani. I'm the National Field Exam Manager for CIT Commercial Services. Uh, the first slide indicates that we're factoring. And just to give you, everyone an idea of what it is we do, we're secured lenders. Uh, we do either asset-based lending or factoring. And, and our primary collateral is accounts receivable and inventory. And from the accounts receivable side, this is where the benefit curve has been the most valuable tool for us. Uh, we've been using it since before. It was actually a part of the software. And years ago, Lee and I did a presentation in Dallas. And unbeknownst to us, Mark Negrini was in the audience. And there was really no better validation to what we were trying to accomplish using the Benford curve than the man who was actually trying to develop this software. And ever since then, um, it's been a truly invaluable tool. And when you're lending on a cash receivable, the biggest problem with lending money is sometimes getting the money back. What this has allowed us to do in certain instances in certain industries, there, there are exceptions. Although we have deviations that Lee's going to walk us through, there could be valid business purposes for those deviations. And over the years, you know, we keep getting asked, well, how many frauds have you detected by using either the IDEA software or the Benford curve? And our answer is we really haven't recently detected any, but we haven't had a fraud since we started doing our analysis using ideas as well as the Benford curve. So with that, I'm going to move on and turn it over to Lee. Yeah. Oh, hi. My name's Lee. Good afternoon. Uh, basically, uh, what, what I'm going to do today <clears throat> is I'm going to talk a little about theory. Theory is important so you can understand it. And then I'm going to move into some uh, <clears throat> actual examples. People always request actual examples. And my hope here today is to give you some tips that we use, that we've used successfully for 15 plus years <clears throat> to catch problems, identify questionable practices. Uh, and, and just, uh, you probably heard of data mining or big data. So IDEA software is really one tool, a very effective tool, that we can use within the context of uh, data mining. So just if you would, keep that in mind. Um, basically, I, my background, I've been in auditing for most of my career, so I actually go out there look at books and records, uh, obtain electronic files, and do the analysis. Um, unfortunately, I don't know what everybody does, but I'm assuming most of you are in, obviously, the accounting and auditing fields. Um, there is a myth that auditors can't, uh, aren't very good at catching fraud. In, in our opinion, using different tools, including IDEA, and including the Benford curve with an idea, it significantly increases our chances. So if people give you large data sets, uh, rather than being intimidating, we, we can learn a tremendous amount from those. Manipulate them, there are tools that we're in, in patterns that we look for, which I'll discuss in a few minutes, that you can use. Um, we receive a lot of information electronically. <clears throat> and my suggestion, I'm, I'm assuming most of you obtain electronic files. My suggestion would be always get um, a complete data set. So if the, try to get a hold of the data dictionary. Um, if a particular, if the database for let's say the AR module or inventory module or AP module contains 30 
attributes, you know, fields of information, I would suggest you try to talk them into giving you the full amount. For the more data you have, the more insight you'll be able to gain into the uh, into the company. Um, it's really cost it, as you go into it, and I would suggest you spend a lot of time just playing with it, fooling with it. The more you think about it, you're going to get into a lot of number theory in general. It's pretty amazing stuff uh, when you get into it. Uh, and each of you can develop your own algorithms or, uh, or I guess, formulas for your specific industries. Um, basically, I guess in a nutshell, when people invent numbers, uh, it will cause the data to veer away from the Benford curve. <clears throat> and we all have inherent biases, like my bias could be to, to the number nine. If we were to ask all of you to create a list of random numbers, each uh, there would be a, a unique pattern in each of those data sets, because Mark might be biased subconsciously to two. I may be subconsciously biased to a nine. Uh, Lindsay to one. So, and the patterns will jump out. I'll show you that in a few minutes. Um, what we would suggest is for on every engagement or uh, at month end, you uh, run the Benford curve on your clients. So, do it, let's say, on the accounts receivable aging, an inventory subledger, an AP, you know, subledger or aging. And then, and that will serve as a baseline. So from month to month or week to week, you'll, you'll, and I'll show you a concrete example in a few minutes. If there's a major variance from that baseline, it's really going to jump out. So, um, and not to belabor it, but Benford, <clears throat> he was a physicist, and back in the 30s, he'd work with log tables, which were in paper, and he just noticed someday that. Certain pages of the logbook were, were were worn more so than others, and that's what kind of got him started. So he examined a lot of data sets, um, stock quotations as I have here, uh, molecular weights, pretty amazing, any amazingly disparate data sets. So the basic idea is when you're dealing with real with random numbers, strangely enough, it's always amazed me. There are inher inherent patterns in that. So you can have a very simple equation which can describe very um, complex um, uh, patterns. One, one of the things that we, we've noticed is when we first started using the Benford curve, we, we had gone back to every known fraud that had occurred in our company. And believe it or not, every we, since we had all the data, we had all the account receivable agents, so we ran the, the Benford curve on all those agents, and the deviation was obvious. And had, had we been using it sooner, we may have been, been able to detect that. Subsequent to that, uh, over the course of time here in our, our southeast office, we went through the whole portfolio. Now, being a factor, we literally buy the company's receivables from them. So. We have all the agents on our own internal loan systems. So over the course of time, my examiners were instructed to, uh, whenever we had downtime, we'd go through the portfolio and we would run the Benford curve on, on every loan. Um, and the deviations that occurred, you know, we, we had multiple choices. One, we can go to our account executives and ask them what these people do. Um, you know, we could research further, we could use ideas and drill down, see who those customers were, what the invoice sizes were. And, um, you know, fortunately, again, uh, we did not find at that time uh, any more frauds in our portfolio. The interesting thing about the curve, we, we lend money to different manufacturing and in different industries. And for one of our furniture clients, they're importers of furniture. So when we go out and do the field exam on that client, they're shipping containers of furniture from overseas to the U.S. There's only so much furniture you can put in a container. So all of their invoices are in the thirteen or $14,000 range. So the first time we ran the benefit curve, we got excited and said, uh oh, we may have a problem here. And then you go find out the business purpose and what the company does. 
and can even come up with a validation as to why that occurs. And typically, we're using the first digit as a starting point. And so when you run the Bedford curve on, on account receivable aging for this particular client, you know, our number one spike way off the chart. It's a good point. Yes, and we'll show you an example, as Mark said, how sometimes the numbers jump off the page. So if internally with your companies, again, unfortunately, I don't know the different companies, but if you can work that in, <clears throat> set up your own uh, scripts, and you can do that an idea, they can, idea can help you with that, then uh, a lot of this stuff can be done automatically. But as far as from a practical point of view, so when you're pulling numbers, if it's describing <clears throat> dollar value of inventory, receivables, or payables, pick the, the first number reading from the left to right. Um, you know, most of us intuitively think that the probability of, in a random set of the number one occurring is one in nine, uh, but it's actually not based on the Benford curve. It's, it's actually almost one in three, 30 percent. And, and this is what the, the Benford curve looks like. It's basically a curve with a negative slope. About 30 percent, the number one, <coughs> number two declines to about 17 percent, and then a little less than five percent for the number nine. Interesting. Uh, and that, this is the actual distribution. So you see how it declines steadily down to 4.6%. Uh, uh, and make sure when you're, that <clears throat> your data sets don't include assigned numbers. There's no, there can't be any arbitrary upper and lower limits that just won't work, such as invoice numbers. The number has to actually represent the quantity or valuation of something something real, like inventory or receivables or payables. Um, when you're dealing with large data sets, very often, like with big data, you're going to stumble across or come across relationships within the data that aren't uh, immediately intuitive. For instance, the, the number pattern is not, I wouldn't find it intuitive. Um, Here's an example. The following is a case of uh, an actual company. <clears throat> uh, the company on paper was 200 million. It was a reviewed financial, not an not an audited or reviewed, but by a pretty good size Houston uh, accounting firm. And you can see in blue is the Benford curve. That's what it in, it should look like. The actual, the, well, not even a curve, the data uh, basically created a, a triangle. Strangely enough, the, the person that perpetrated the fraud, the president of the company, when they created what he thought were random numbers, he only used twos and uh, threes. That's a bit extreme, but it, does ha it's, it actually happened. Mark and I came across that. Um, another thing to remember is that using, utilizing Benford along with the other analytical techniques you can use in IDEA, even lar large data sets could be 500 megabytes, really mean nothing. You'll be able to discern the uh, discern patterns. Uh, what we would suggest is um, you can do your digital analysis at least once a month. So you'll have a, um, you know, a, a frame of reference and a, a baseline. Um, and it's very easy to uh, manipulate the data, but it, it will jump out of, uh, of the page with uh, if you use the Benford curve. And again, I'm going to show you an example of that in a minute. Uh, most fraudsters. Um, they're usually caught in a complex web of circumstances. They're under pressure. Uh, they're rushed. They don't really understand uh, what, how the Benford curve works, so they don't really understand how to create a truly random data set. So that's one, at least one advantage we have. <clears throat> uh, and as Mark mentioned, it, it not only provides insight, <clears throat> the Benford curve, into 
um, maybe fraudulent transactions, but it can uh, can sh demonstrate changes or highlight rather changes in business lines, business practices, as well as manufactured records. So in other words, if they're selling small quantities <clears throat> and then they jump to container quantities, the, the patterns are going to look different. Uh, another suggestion is spend a lot of time, and, and I'll show you an example in a minute, uh, analyzing subsets. So if the number two is overrepresented, then drill down, and you can do that with IDEA, and I'll show you how to do that in a second. <clears throat> and you can save that sub, uh, that file, uh, subset of the data file, and you can take a closer look, and then you can do your additional testing. Uh, as Mark mentioned, Dr. Negrini, if you're interested, he wrote a book on utilizing the Benford curve. Very interesting. And one of the things is, a key point is, if you have a file with only 100 records, it's not as useful as a file with 10,000 records. So you should have at least 1,000 records. That's why I was talking about a complete data set if possible. So shoot for at least 1,000 records. Um, but although you, you, know, you can, some things will jump out with smaller um, data sets. There, there are some of our clients where we have less than 1,000 records on their ages. And so when it comes time to actually do the audit, what the examiners will do is go back, um, since we get a month end aging, if there's not a thousand records on there to run the curve and get a good statistical um, picture, what we'll do is we'll, we'll get their sales journals for the last six months. And so we'll increase our sample size or our population by going actually back to the sales register as opposed to what's currently in, in their accounts receivable. So there are ways to you know, beef up your sample size so that you're statistically valid according to the, the document you need. Exactly, exactly. Uh, the next uh, slide, uh, and again, unfortunately, I don't know uh, if a lot of you, I'm sure a lot of you use uh, IDEA frequently. Some of you are probably starting out. So the, the basic procedure is just you import the, 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 the detail file, the subledger. Um, you open the analysis tab, select Benford's law, um, and then it'll generate the curve. And I will go over to IDEA, and here's a subdirectory. This is an actual data file. Uh, uh, it's not modified, it's a real data file. What, what we would suggest, what works for us is <clears throat> when you're doing this from month to month, you know, look at the, uh, step one, what we would suggest is look at the size of the file. So if a typical inventory file, in this case, are, it runs about 5.3 megabytes. And, um, and it, when you open it up, it, it has 43,759 records or somewhere in there. It has a value of about 4 million on this smaller client. Um, if they modified it, uh, if there was some fraud perpetrated or, or, or a mistake, sometimes errors occur, then it, you'll, you should be able to notice the difference. I, step, if the, fi if the number of records changes materially or the file size ma changes materially, unless there's been a, some other significant change in the company business, that will be your initial red flag. So, so basically, you import it, and you will get a file like this. So that's your basic uh, data file. You can see 43,759 records. Uh, and if this is the first time you're doing it, that could be your, uh, your baseline. Uh, then you would run the, uh, the Benford curve, extended cost. And now that, for, it, for an inventory file, it's actually a very close fitting curve. We found that for accounts receivable files and perhaps uh, AP files, your fits aren't as generalizing. So you'll have to look at it, run it for each of your companies. So each of you is probably in different industries, and I would suggest 
start compiling a, a, probably a normal distribution for your clients. Um, so that, that's basically the, um, this is an actual raw data. So here's another one I, I, I modified. I just threw in some additional numbers. If you'll notice, it's 43,759 records. And we've seen people do use similar techniques. And the, uh, the file size is almost identical. I'm opening up the field stats. Now, you always use this. It's a very ha handy tool. So the extended cost is 7,879,000 7, versus this one. This is the good file is 4 million. So obviously it's a material difference. Um, so that obviously is a red flag. So what we do is we go back to the Benford and the first one and you'll see how it, this uh, Benford curve closely tracks, uh, excuse me, how their curve closely tracks the Benford curve. And then we move over to the next curve it looked a little odd. And if you'll notice, the number nine and the number two are over, over, over represented. So you see two here and nine, how close they are. And on the modified, two and nine. So that in itself tells you, oops, those are over represented. Um, so what you can do initially, what I would say, the first step I do is I just click on it, I can do display records or save records. So now you have a mentioning earlier, uh, subsets are really important. So you have your data set, and if something doesn't look right, do an extraction, and I'll show you how to do that in a second with an idea, and you can save this. And this is uh, modified file. So boom. So and that's um, so. Let's go back to uh, the file that we think is is an where there's an anomaly. It's not the same. Uh, it looks a little different. It's bigger than our typical month-to-month -month files. So what I would suggest is uh, one thing we look for is random numbers. Very often when people create false numbers, typically they don't create many, many smaller values. They tend to create a relatively few <clears throat> number of large and often round values. So I would encourage everyone to start studying the characteristics of your unique data sets and you'll start getting a feel for it. So with an idea, there's something called direct extraction. So we'll just say round numbers and open up the equation editor. Again, I don't know if you use the equation editor, very useful. And um, let's see. I created, uh, there's, uh, there's different uh, functions which are very useful and you can save them uh, in this subdirectory, round numbers. So reading from left to right, extended cost is the name of the attribute basically the value. So I'm saying <clears throat> extended cost is greater than zero and it's a conditional. The extended cost, the percentage sign you see is, is MOD. <clears throat> you see, it returns the remainder when one numeric expression is divided by another. So basically what you're saying is you take the attribute name, you hit mod MOD, <clears throat> and then if you want uh, numbers with um, values with round numbers like a thousand, you, you just type in a thousand equals zero. Hit OK, valid equation, boom. So remember we have 43,000 actual records and yes. So now lo and behold you have 130 records and they're all round numbers. <clears throat> And this is an example, we've run, but we've run into things very similar to this. So now, instead of spending a long time reviewing the 43,000 records, <coughs> excuse me, 
you have a subset which is five million, which in, for a client like this would be very odd, and you see all your um, your um, round numbers, and then we would do the substantive testing. You know, we'd look at invoices, shipping, records, orders, etc. So uh, that would be basically, you know, our basic suggestion for um, uh, one of the techniques to use. Um, do, do any of you have any questions so far before we continue? Uh, it might be useful to see what kind of um, um, what kind we, of thoughts you have. Uh, we have gotten a couple of questions actually. Um, I'll just start at the top. Um, and one of the questions is regarding to population size. If running on the AP, should you do a separate Benfords for every vendor, or just um, the accounts payable in general? And I think that's for more of like an internal audit perspective. Well, I would think number one, you would do it um, <clears throat> for the entire data set. Okay. So it would be the entire AP aging. <clears throat> uh, typically, if you're doing it for individual vendors, and again, I don't know how big it is. If this is a large public company, there's no reason you couldn't run Benford curves <clears throat> at the vendor level. Uh, and there's many other things you can do with IDEA, but I would um, I would do it overall at the overall level, at the full data set level, because usually at the at the if you're doing it just by vendor, unless you're dealing with very large companies. She's You're saying not going to really get a thousand. She's saying it's a very large um, millions of um, records. Oh, okay, okay. In that case, I, I would run it at the uh, at the highest level, at the sub ledger level, and then definitely uh, run it at the bend, at the um, at the uh, at the vendor level. If, if she did run, if she did run the whole AP aging through the the Benford curve. Notice the deviation in a, in a particular number. She could then drill down into that number using ideas, and chances are she's going to find the vendor that, that may be causing that deviation to occur. Um, so you know, I mean, it, it's we our our loan sizes run typically from five million all the way to a hundred million, and so we we typically start with the big picture and work our way down, but. Um, if, if she's got sizes that big for a particular uh, vendor, there's, there's nothing wrong. It's just that it may take longer because you'd want to run every vendor on the AP list. Exactly. And, and just a, a little a, a footnote to what Mark said, just from talking to people in our industry, very often statistically, and I'm generalizing, the highest error rates often occur with uh, accounts payable. Uh, it's just sometimes you have a higher turnover of people, etc. So if you're looking for error rates, very often they tend to be higher in accounts payable. So just just a thought. And when you <clears throat> and when you've identified something with IDEA, you can also look at um, uh, look for other patterns. Like um, you can do. Uh, average unit price for that vendor and compare it to unit prices for other vendors that provide similar goods or services. Okay. So that's uh, one thing. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, that was, I was going to say thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, our next question that we had um, says, we do annual audits. The times I have done Benford's Law, it's been on check registers throughout the entire year. Is it better to run it on one month at a time, or should it not make a difference as long as there's a complete data set? I think as long as there's a... Oh, I'm sorry. Mark, did you want to... No, go ahead, Lee. We're going to answer Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, I would generally, as a starting point, run it on, on the full data set. The bigger the data set, uh, the better. So I would, um, I would initially run it on the, the full cash disbursements journal. Okay. And then if you want to dr drill down into subsets, um, uh, you can do it that way. Good questions. Good questions. See, that, uh, that's good. I'm glad you're asking me questions. I, I, uh, not being in the same room, um, 
it's uh, it's a little trickier to know what uh, areas you want um, additional explanation or detail on. So if you have questions, you know, please keep them coming. Okay. Lindsay, uh, we, any other questions? We do have a few more actually. Um, so one says. I investigated a fraud or there was one fraudulent check of $860 per month out of about a thousand or so checks per month. They um, they ran the Benford's first digit analysis on the annual check register, but it didn't show up. Is there any tricks or tips that you guys have to help that they could have done to help them detect the fraud? And how much was the check again? What was the actual, was it a round number? It was, yes, $860. And it was only one check per Out of like per a thousand, period of, yeah. Hmm. I'll have to think about that one. That's good. Usually usually the pattern, the number is a little bigger. Um, if, if the number is that small, and if it's in, in common, is it, uh, was there was it a very large check register? It, he said a thousand records. Okay, that's not a lot. One thing you can do, just a suggestion is, uh, look for the, the frequency that that the um, that there no, where there is no um, the frequency of occurrence for transactions where there are no decimals. So the decimals are point zero zero. So I mean, was that something that occurred? Uh, because very often, look for if it's very often it's unusual to get a lot of transactions with no decimals at the end. Uh, and so I, that would be my suggestion. Okay. Very small amounts like that are kind of tricky to catch if it's only yeah. one transaction per month. You know, if somebody if somebody steals one check. And catching one one fraudulent check, it, it's going to be very difficult to detect. Um, yeah, you, even with ideas, even even with the Benford code, um, you know one of one of the things I've I've been I've been with CIT now. I uh, just celebrated 40 years here. I figured I'd give it a couple more years and see if I like it. But 38 <laughs> of the 40 years I've been in some audit capacity. And one of the things I have learned, whether it was when I was with internal audit or with the operating company I'm now with, is, is all too often when, when auditors would go pick a sample, you know, they're always looking to pick the 10 largest invoices in an AR agent. Or the, when, even when our own internal auditors come in now, they're looking at, they want to look at our top 10 loans so that they can go back and say they covered a bigger percentage of the, of the total loan outstanding here. And, and one of the things that Ideas in the Benford Curve has really taught us and to the benefit of using ideas in the first place is instead of sampling, we can now look at every transaction, every line on a, on a perpetual agent. So um, to find one transaction, you know, um, it, it is it is truly difficult. And um, you know, I don't know that we have a right answer for picking out one stolen fraudulent check for you. And I apologize for that, but that's the reality sometimes. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Sometimes that they're very clever. One pattern, though, uh, is that <clears throat> statistically, it's just a generalization, but frauds tend to get bigger. Usually, in, initially, they're not detected. So, if you notice a, a payment to a vendor is eight hundred dollars one month, and nine hundred next month, and a thousand, it, it's something to look into. If this person's been taking that exact amount out for months or years, they're they're unusually disciplined. Mm -hmm. But I would definitely suggest just looking at, also, if you're dealing with payables, look for um, um, decimals, numbers where they're, um, where you have, or with vendors or disbursements where there's a statistically higher than average instance of disbursements with zero cents. That's good. I hope that helps. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes. Um, in your in the last example with the the twos and the nines looked odd. Where do you draw the line in analyzing the detail? For example, do you have a number of specific tests you run on the subsets, like the mod formula, or if nothing unusual pops up, do you conclude as such and move on? That, that's a very good question. Uh, sometimes when you're doing an initial audit. <clears throat> 
you don't really have the frame of reference. So you have to rely more on uh, substantive testing source documents. Uh, what we're suggesting here for all of you, it applies to us, is that you know start running the Benford curves at the end of this month, and that will serve as a baseline. So uh, pretty soon, you'll start getting a feel for what looks normal. So like for every client in, every, in, in different industries that we finance, uh, well, let's say with, with this particular client, uh, for their inventory report historically, uh, every month or every quarter or every year, their Benford curve tracks very closely. So if they started modifying the file, uh, and sometimes it's actually uh, inadvertent. It's not always um, a fraud. I've had people make a mistake and, um, and it'll show up. So uh, that would be my suggestion. Good okay. question. What our, exam, what our examiners are instructed to do when they go in and get an aging um, and run the Bedford curve initially, if there are deviations in the twos or the threes, our subsequent testing, like looking at shipping documentation, trucker verifications, account receivable verifications uh, by telephone or, or however. Um, so if we, if we do have a deviation in a particular number, you know, I would expect that that examiner is picking more invoices that begin with number two for their ship test. Um, and again, going back to what, what I had mentioned earlier, you know, years ago in our business credit unit, um, we did a prospect exam and we had a big deviation in the number four. And when we started asking questions about what is this, it was a wire company. And lo and behold, there was one product that they sold which was spooled on so many feet of wire and the average cost of those spools was $4,000. So, you know, again, we were able to go back, take that back. Um, and, and find out what we consider the valid business purpose for having a deviation. So the Benford curve is just another tool in our tool belt to hopefully point us in the right direction of what we should be looking for when we start the field exam. Okay. That's a good point. Yeah, and going back to the question, I'm not sure I've ever run across or read about um, something that, that really tells us if it's a 1% deviation or 2% deviation, uh, basically the way we do it is we do a, a lot of substantive testing and we say based for this particular client, this is the how close it, the, their data set conforms to the Benford curve. So from month to month, if it starts varying a lot, then that's when we drill down and that's where we tended to catch problems. So I'm not sure there's just an absolute 1% or 2% or 5%. Um, my, my suggestion. Um, the ne uh, another question that we've received um, says that there's a, been an observation that the digits five and six um, are almost always not in line with the Benford pattern. Um, sort of, what does this mean that it's not reliable, or do you have any insights as to why this might be? So he, he or she is saying that on the data sets they're working on, the the uh, you said the four and five so the, fi the five and the six the five and six are not on in line with the pattern. Well, you know, kind of, like, oh, go ahead, Mark. I think you have to kind of know what the data set they're looking at. Let, let's say yeah. we went to a manufacturing company involved in Georgia that manufactured carpet, and we decided to run the Benford curve on their payroll checks for the plant. You know. We, you know, we might wind up with a with an extreme amount of twos and threes. So, can, to help answer the question, is, can they give us more information about what kind of data set they're looking at? Um, yeah. If you can, oh. go ahead and type that in, and we can come back to. It. I'm not seeing anything popping up right now. Um, and, and oh, and uh, if I may, just to continue along that train of thought, if um, and I'm trying not to answer the make too many generalizations, but um, if let's say the number five and six are underrepresented, that means that something else is going to be overrepresented. So let's say the ones are over overrepresented. What I would do is do this, do extract records, and you have your data set, 
and then do substantive tests and do additional test work on that subset. So maybe uh, do pick a, a sample of items and look at the uh, source documents or discuss the findings with um, uh, your client or look at the prices and compare how do those prices compare with uh, industry averages and maybe do test counts. So basically, uh, if, if something's if four and, if five and six are underrepresented, that means it just means that something else they've created more of ones or nines. So I would go drill down and um, take do more substantive test work on those. Uh, does, does that help or? Um, she gave a little uh, bit more information and said that it's actually something that she had read just in general about Benford's law um, that there's a deviation in the digit five. Um, we've had another person speak up and say that in payables files, one thing you can look at is that fives can spike because uh, professional services um, get billed in even 500s, 5,000s, 50,000s. And um, what I'm going to say is we do have um, some additional documents that we'll include that sort of explain more about Benford's and tell, you know, when to use it, where to use it. So when we send the follow-up email to you guys tomorrow, um, we will try to include some additional uh, documents that y'all can kind of check back on. Um, we've gotten a lot of questions, Lee. I don't know if you want to keep answering questions or if you want to do another example. Um, well, maybe the question so I can get feedback. And, and going just one last point, um, uh, yeah, that is a, that whoever the, the spoke up, that's a very good point. Um, let, let's say if you're looking at expense reports, very often the cutoff will be right under 25 or with payables, you might have a spike in disbursements under a specific cutoff limit. So if, if you're, if the cutoff limit is 5,000 for higher level, level, excuse me, level approvals, then you may see a spike in uh, four thousand dollar invoices. So, so the 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 um, uh, the participant is exactly right. That's uh, he or she is exactly right. That's a very good point. Okay. Um. So, do you want me to read you some more questions? Oh yes, please. Okay. Um. Let me start back at the top. Um, when you, where do you generally set your fudgy logic setting? Would it vary based on your data set? It varies by the data set. Usually the data sets we work with are um, very large data sets, thousands, tens of thousands of records. In some cases, uh, if it's under, let's say if your data set just contains 900 records, and I think it's defaulting at 1,000, I would just adjust it to not, you know, to whatever the, the, uh, the number of records in your data set is. Okay. Um, what about data sets that have positive and negative values? Um, would you run Benford's on both? Um, how would you sort of uh, attack that kind of a data set? Uh, I would just do, uh, like we did here, I would do, uh, an ex I'm trying to get uh, over, first I would do a direct extraction and just um, do like this one. I would do this positive dot. I would do just uh, positive values. And again, I don't know what the data set is, but let, if you're looking at an inventory file, uh, negative numbers can actually indicate uh, errors. So you're relieving something when you actually don't have any inventory. I mean, that's a possibility. But to answer your question specifically, I would use the a direct extraction and do positive values. So I would do extended cost is greater than zero. Ah. So there, it reduced the data set substantially. So I would do it on uh, positive values. Okay. In other words, if they're trying to create bogus uh, numbers, it's usually positive values. They're trying to overstate inventory receivables or unless there's a unique circumstance. Okay. Um, thank you. Would you oh, and, and I should add, oh, and I didn't want to get too fine a point on it, but if, if for some reason these are, it's a sales journal and they all, all show up as uh, credits, 
uh, I would just convert those to positive numbers uh, again. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, would unit costs in purchasing activity be a valid field to run the Benford's analysis on, or would a transaction total be more appropriate? Oh, run that back one more time, Lindsay. Um, um, unit cost in purchasing activities, oh, yeah. would that be a valid field to run Benford's, or um, would it be better to do something like transaction total? No, definitely do it at the detail level. Yeah, definitely do it at the individual line item level. And I would rec I would suggest that the also do the extended, so not just unit price, although I, you could do that. We usually do it at the extended, so if the unit price is one and you have a thousand units, do it at the thousand dollar number. Or you can also do quantity if you want. But yeah, definitely, it's always better to do it at the most basic level of detail. Thank you. Other than round numbers, what other tests or formulas do you suggest? Um, okay, I would look at, uh, depending on the data sets, I would look at uh, um, decimals. And you can also, I would use uh, duplicate key detection. I've never tried it on this particular, uh, excuse me, uh, this particular data set. So you can do, uh, well, it might work better on receivables, but. Uh, I can't remember all the attribute names offhand on this, but you could do fields to match, extended cost, and uh, usually it's better to run it on, let me see, ah, on a sales journal. There we go. Sales history file, duplicate key, exclusion. You could do fields to match, customer date, and Let's see, sales value, fields that must be different, customer. Uh, so it shows you, here's a, that would be a suggestion. So it shows you uh, they're selling the same amount to different companies on the same date, and based on what you know of the, of the company, um, you know, you can do substantive testing. But I would say try this, a duplicate key detection and exclusion. Okay. I, I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Um, can you sort of maybe discuss, I'm not sure how easy this one is, but to discuss when or whether you should change the Benford's Law default settings with an idea. Um, one of the examples she gave was fuzzy logic. Um, and then kind of as a asterisk to that, would you mind um, detailing a little bit about how the fuzzy logic setting works within Benford's? Okay. Uh, I mean, I, what is the def I think the default is, um, what is the... Uh, We just click on advanced. So this is a minimum record. So usually with our with our um, data sets, are, they tend to be fairly large. Ever so often we run into a data set that's um, less than that. So I would just go in here. So you just go into uh, the Benford's law, do advanced, and if it's 800, change it to 800. And, and also, as we talked about for decimals, you know, you can uh, click here. Last two digits are zero. I, I hope that helps. If that's your question, that, that's how I would do it. Okay. Thank you. Um, how do you review data when a first digit, um, in ex this example, a five on an inventory file is underrepresented? Oh, she's saying, or he's saying, what do we do if it's underrepresented? Yes, like how would you best, um, I guess, what would you um, recommend as the best next steps to review that data file if a digit is, un a first digit is underrepresented? Well, if, if something's, everything has to total to 100 or 1.0. 
So if something's if the five is underrepresented, that means something like in this second field, like in the second file, the like six is underrepresented. So something else has to be overrepresented. So if the over, if the twos and nines are overrepresented. I would uh, extract those data sets and take a closer look. So in other words, if something's underrepresented, if I focus, like, like in this case, um, this Benford curve, this is the actual raw data. So they were trying to manipulate by adding a lot of nines and twos, larger numbers. So you see here how closely this, they can form versus the modified the nines and the and the two. So I would focus on, on obviously if something on the curve. One of the numbers is going to be correspondingly overrepresented. So I would focus on those numbers. Okay. That's usually how it works. Thank you. Um, can you or do you perform analysis on more than just the first digit, um, like the first two digits or the first three digits? Well, yes, sometimes we, you, you can, yes. And the Benford curve does allow that. Um, I usually just look for decimals and certain things, certain patterns in the data, uh, round numbers, um, uh, changes in, in pricing between periods for different customers, different vendors. Uh, but you can use that. But I, that's not something I've done personally. Uh, uh, Usually, we've gotten a lot of success just with the first digit and the last two digits. Um, thank you. For the suspicious data extracts, um, how does IDEA determine how many suspicious outputs to provide? Um, they've run a Benford's law, and there were 18,000 instances of the number five as the first digit, and the output of suspicious, suspicious data was 100 records. I, I don't know if you have uh, that insight or not. Oh, repeat that one more time. Um, sorry. Um, she was saying, like, she, there were, with regards to the suspicious data extracts, uh -huh. um, how does IDEA determine how many suspicious outputs to provide? Um, they had an example where they ran Benford's Law, and there were close to 18,000 instances of the number five as the first digit, and the output of suspicious data was only 100 records. So how does, do you know how IDEA sort of determines what's suspicious? Well, I mean, if, if I understand the question, what IDEA does is they're, all, all it's doing is telling you for this particular data set, the number five is either overrepresented, underrepresented, or about matching what it should, what in theory it should be. Um, uh, as far as, from there, you just need to drill into the data sets and do additional testing, substantive testing. Or uh, can you ask the, the the questioner if that's their question? Um, please type in I if you want to make sure I don't need some more additional information. Um, while they are, um, if they do type in, um, then let me also ask. Um, if the mean absolute deviation for the file indicates that the data file is out of conformity, will that change the testing patterns? Um, sorry, I'm not sure if I, I shouldn't have read that one. <laughs> I, well, yes, if, if, if something is not conforming, uh, then what we always do is we do more substantive testing. Because basically the Benford is just kind of giving you, it's almost a red flag, or it's indicating that something's outside of the norm. So if it's something outside of the norm, then in, for your particular companies, your particular industries, then that just lets us uh, drill down. Because basically if they're creating fraudulent invoices, they need to have bogus numbers. They're going to have to have invoices, source stock, you know, bills relating, orders, packing lists, just a lot of information. Uh, purchase receipts. So we just use it as a tool to identify uh, things that are outside the norm. And then we do, it just kind of gives us a head up, heads up. It's just a red flag. And then we do substantive testing. Thank you. In other words, I, I, 
always make sure you look at it within the context of your of the data sets you work with all the time. Because what may be agings, there in our experience, customer sales, you're not going to have a Benford that tracks, excuse me, a curve that tracks the Benford as closely as inventory. I'm generalizing, but that's generally the case. So just because something <clears throat> doesn't conform closely on the first go round, you may not know. You, you, uh, but the next month and the month after that, you'll get a better feel. Yeah, it's really, it's really, you know, we we use it to help the examiner get pointed in the correct direction, whether it's more testing or getting, you know, valid business purposes for why this happens or better understandings of what the company does. Um, so, you know, it, it should make them think. Um, again, instead of going in and picking the top 30 invoices to do a shift test, um, you know, we run the benefit curve and then if we have a deviation, we, we go where it tells us we should be looking. Pick more invoices starting with the number two or find out why we have this curve. So, um, you know, and, and it's proven, and we, we can validate this, it's, it's proven itself to our examiners to go in and, and where, when it tells them to go look here, um, it, it's, you know, well-founded and, and generally we, we come back with a good reason or we come back with a problem. One of the things in our industry that you don't want our field examiners to do is when we go look at a new piece of business is to buy in a, a, a fraud that's, you know, that company is with a, with a different lender right now and they want to move because maybe the other lender has um, lender fatigue. So they call us up and, you know, hey, would you guys like to lend this money? And, you know, the worst thing I can do as the audit manager and the only way I'm going to lose my job here probably is if one of my guys goes out and we do an audit we recommend to our credit people that we, we go ahead, sign this deal, do the loan, and then three months later, we find out we just bought somebody else's problem, hmm. and we have a fraud. So, you know, it's, it's imperative to have all the help and tools that we can, so that we can alleviate that, and you know, on the front end before it becomes a problem. Right. Good point. And, and again, just to, to uh, resummarize, you know, I don't want people thinking that uh, this is uh, basically what the Benford is saying <clears throat> is that if uh, if these larger data sets are truly random. The, the, the incorporated numbers, on, depending on, on the type of file, like let's say inventory, will tend to track the Benford curve. With receivables, they very often may not be uh, conform as closely. But once you start, with the, one of the most beneficial things is once you start compiling these ben, or creating Benford curves on a monthly basis for say company A, company B, company C, <clears throat> if there's any changes, uh, they're probably going to stand out as the case as the case here. I, I hope I'm clear on this. So there's not a there's not it's it's more by it's it's more by relative thing. So the for this company, if suddenly uh, if month after month after month the Benford curve conforms and suddenly it doesn't conform, uh, <clears throat> that's a problem. Uh, if with, what you can do is you can go back and get agings or subledgers for the last 12 months and run them to see if the pattern is consistent. And we, we use this as a tool, one of the tools in combination with other tools, idea, I guess, tools we use, and uh, combination with substantive testing. I, I hope that helps. Yes, thank you, Lee oh. and Mark. Any other questions? Um, we have a, a number of questions still, actually, but we are out of time. Um, I don't know if it might be best to sort of, um, it kind of sounds like we've wrapped up, but um, with these questions, what might be easiest to do is to sort of look through them and send them your way. Um, this, uh, we have one last kind of um, hopefully easily answered question. Um, can Benford be used for audit related unpredictability testing such as SAS 99? 
I need a little more clarification on that question. <laughs> okay. Um, then I think what I want to do is um, I'll send you any of the questions we weren't able to get to, and I'll also send them to our support team, the IDEA Help Desk. They usually um, can reach out to you with any um, advice and be able to sort of help work through your data sets. And um, same thing with your sales a person. So I will send these questions and if your question didn't get answered, we will get an answer to you in the next few days and we'll also be sending the recording and the slides um, in the next couple of days as well. So thank you very much yeah. for all of your questions and I'm going to let Lee f um, or Mark finish up. Well, uh, yeah, Mark, if it's okay with you, yeah, if they can send us, Lindsay, the questions, we can address these individually as best we can. I will definitely do that. And um, if you have any other questions that um, you didn't get a chance to answer in the webcast, you can email um, me at lindsayf at automation.com or marketing at automation.com and I will get your questions to Lee and Mark for um, further review. Um, thank you all for joining us. We um, enjoyed this conversation, and thank you for sharing your expertise, and have a great afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Hope I helped a little bit. Thank you.